Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, we are both very excited to be here. Um, so we're just going to kick it off with a quick introduction into muscle weakness associated with cystinosis. Um, so before renal transplantation became available and before the introduction of cystamine, there wasn't very much known about the later um, onset manifestations in cystinosis. And then um, in the late 1980s, the first case of severe myopathy in cystinosis was reported. And um, this patient presented with um, dysphagia around 20 years of age, followed by hand and muscle weakness, and then wasting of both proximal and distal upper and lower extremities. And um, the photo on the top right here is a different study, but there you can see um, the muscle wasting and atrophy of um, those hand muscles. And other studies have had similar findings um, that the hand muscles are often um, first affected and most severely. And this has been attributed to accumulation of cysteine in muscle tissue, which you can see on the bottom right there, and previous reports estimate between 20 and 60 percent of patients develop muscle weakness and difficulty swallowing. Before we get into um, the specifics of our study that we've conducted over the past several years, I wanted to just take a minute and provide a little overview about swallowing, why we think about it, why it's so important for um, overall health and well-being. I was inspired by the talks yesterday that gave the little anatomy and physiology um, blurbs, so I wanted to um, do one as well. So swallowing is incredibly complicated, and we don't really think about it until um, it changes and it becomes difficult. It involves over 30 pairs of muscles and nerves that have to be working um, perfectly strengthened and timed in order to move food and liquid from our lips down into our stomachs. So it's a lot more involved. Um, and needs to be carefully analyzed and managed. We think about swallowing in four phases. The oral preparatory phase, which involves putting the food in, in your mouth, chewing it, creating a bolus. The oral transport phase, moving the bolus down, um, <clears throat> from the oral cavity into your pharynx. The pharyngeal phase, which involves airway clearance and um, beginning to open up the esophagus. And finally, the esophageal phase, which um, is where the food moves through the esophagus and um, finally arrives in the stomach. We are going to, um, for the, intense, uh, the purposes of our research and this talk, just focus on the first three phases of swallowing, the oral prep, transport, and pharyngeal phase. And then um, just to show you how sophisticated and complicated swallowing really is to get to that, that final result of eating that big cheeseburger. Um, Swallowing, again, the reason we talk about it all the time, and I always say this to my patients, I'm going to constantly ask you all these questions because it's so very important that we understand what's happening for you and how it's changing. Um, consequences of difficulty swallowing um, in adults and children, but focusing on adults for today, are inadequate nutrition and hydration, um, difficulty taking oral medications, which um, I don't have to emphasize to individuals living with cystinosis, how um, very complicated that can be. Um, in the more extreme circumstances, there's uh, risk for respiratory infections or development of pneumonia if, if um, material is constantly going down the wrong way. And then um, very importantly, and perhaps most importantly, is the impact on quality of life and um, social consequences. So um, when people have changes to their swallowing, they may limit themselves socially or feel like um, meal times are not a way that they can meaningfully engage, meaningfully engage with loved ones. So there's, it's a big deal um, to think about that part as we talk about swallowing as well. These, this little video blurb right here um, is an example of a video swallowing study, um, which is the type of swallowing assessment we used in our study. Um, it's an x-ray um, movie, sort of, where you swallow various consistencies of barium, which is a type of contrast, and it allows you to isolate and evaluate the different muscles, the timing of the muscles, the presence and absence of um, strength and aspiration and accumulation of residue, et cetera. So the first little video, we'll just press play, is a normal swallow, and we see the black entering the oral cavity, which is the barium contrast. You do not want the um, material to go into the trachea. Uh, um, everything timed. The second example is a very extreme example of dysphagia where um, the patient is not only experiencing airway invasion where the material is going into the airway, but also um, various levels of weakness where um, post-swallow residue is accumulating in the pharyngeal recesses. 
So very, very simply and basically, um, there may be subtle changes to swallowing function that occur in adults um, and evolve over time that are not so obvious, such as just coughing or choking while you're eating. Some of these can include um, development of oral residue in a way that you didn't experience previously. As tongue, the tongue muscle experiences subtle changes, it becomes more of a masher and less of a um, you know, maker of a clean bolus that can easily be cleared from your throat, um, unintentional weight loss, not other spe otherwise specified, and various other things to look out for um, to kind of just keep on your radar. Do do I have any type of weakness? Am I having changes to my swallowing? And it may not be as obvious um, in the early stages. So things to mention to your providers as well. So um, I wanted to mention um, the test of masticating and swallowing solids. I know this was brought up in a talk given yesterday, so I wanted to uh, be sure to address it. So swallowing is not something that's been really um, readily talked about in the cystinosis population. Um, Sony's and her group did um, some early research in 2005 out of the NIH and started to describe changes in swallowing common to patients with cystinosis. More recently, um, there's a study which used this um, test of the TOMAS to identify um, presence of dysphagia to solid foods in patients with um, cystinosis. And they did find um, that there were significant differences in the ability to um, perform the oral phase of swallowing. And these findings were um, similar to patients with myotonic dystrophy. Again, this is a screening tool. Um, it doesn't provide a comprehensive understanding of the swallowing changes. And these are really the two things that have been talked about and looked at more recently. So um, we were excited to think about swallowing um, as it relates to weakness in a, in a new way. Okay, so just to give you guys a bit of a background on the studies that we've conducted up until this point, um, our first study started in 2017 and um, it had the aim of kind of further characterizing myopathy and dysphagia in this population, so specifically to see um, how common these um, symptoms are, how severe they are, which muscles might be affected, and then to look at associations between myopathy, dysphagia, and um, patient symptoms. Um, then in 2018, we started phase two of the study, um, where we repeated all of the study assessments in the same patients one year later to look to see if there's any uh, longitudinal changes over the one year period, um, and to see which of our outcome measures were sensitive enough to detect changes over that time. And then following that observational phase, we, um, our patients underwent a five week uh, training regimen using an expiratory muscle strength trainer, which is shown in the, shown in the bottom right here. And this has been used in other disease populations um, in an attempt to improve cough force, which um, can improve an individual's ability to tolerate aspiration and um, therefore improve swallow safety. And so our objective here was to evaluate the feasibility of using that device and it, um, any impact it might have on swallowing and breathing function in this patient population. Um, and we are now in the midst of phase three of the study, um, which aims to further characterize myopathy and dysphagia using some more precise measurement tools and um, to look at the capacity of muscles to regenerate. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so just to quickly go through the list of assessments that we performed um, at all three visits in phases one and two. Um, so we performed a series of Clinical outcome measures, um, patients underwent a detailed neuromuscular examination, including manual muscle testing of both proximal and distal upper and lower extremities, as well as grip and pinch um, dynamometry to measure uh, strength objectively. Um, patients also underwent walking tests to measure leg strength and the nine hole peg test to measure hand dexterity. We also administered three different patient reported outcomes, including the 10 item eating assessment tool or E10, and the MD Anderson dysphagia in inventory, or the MDADI, which are both dysphagia outcome measures. And then we also developed and administered the distal myopathy function scale, which is a measure of um, distal myopathy symptoms. Just to add one little piece to the um, patient reported outcome measures regarding pertaining to dysphagia, we wanted to make sure that um, we were capturing more um, than just the physical symptoms that patients were experiencing. We wanted to talk about the social, the emotional, um, and the financial.
environmental um, considerations. And so these two um, tools were selected because they um, specifically address those issues um, related to swallowing as well. The um, respiratory outcomes that that we collected were maximum expiratory pressures, um, MEPs, and peak cough flow. We um, were interested in looking at these things for two reasons. Um, one is that in other disease populations, they have been found to, I feel like I'm echoing, um, they have been found to correlate with um, the presence of silent aspirin and maybe a useful screening tool to um, move towards um, further instrumental examinations of swallowing physiology as well as um, correlating with, as Natalie said, um, patients' ability to generate a functional cough, which um, can improve ability to tolerate aspiration should it occur um, in the absence of being able to treat it in other ways. Or look at the cough. And then we administered video fluoroscopic swallowing studies, which is the little video that we showed earlier. Um, that was an example of that. The video fluoroscopic swallowing studies were initially um, reviewed using the penetration aspiration scale, which is an eight-point ordinal scale that describes um, airway invasion and patient response. So for example, uh, penetration aspiration scale one is no contrast has entered the airway, and it's like that first swallow that we showed, completely normal. Penetration aspiration scale of an eight, which is the most severe, is contrast enters the airway, migrates down into the trachea, is not not ejected, cough, and the patient has no response, so silent aspiration, and then various severities in between. So the swallow studies were um, analyzed, and the worst um, rating of each swallow was given a PAS score, and we used that as a way to detect dysphagia initially in this study. So um, in these phases, we examined 20 patients. The graph on the top right kind of shows the breakdown of how many patients showed symptoms of distal weakness and dysphagia and how many patients showed signs of weakness and dysphagia. So we found that most patients did experience some degree of um, muscle weakness and dysphagia. And um, all patients who had lower extremity weakness, both um, on exam and in surveys, also had upper extremity weakness. Um, and um, one finding that was very notable to us was that although 12 patients reported some degree of dysphagia on on um, the surveys, only six patients showed signs of dysphagia using the penetration aspiration scale. So this kind of led us to conclude that the uh, PA scale might not be effective in capturing these impairments in this pa pa patient population. And this gap between patient experience and objective swallowing measurement was one of the driving factors for the next phase of our study. Um, we also found that swallowing issues were more common in patients with weakness. And you can see on the bottom right here in this graph, it shows the MDADI and E10 scores for patients who did and did not have weakness. And we also found a correlation between degree of weakness and breathing issues. So this kind of um, implies that there might be a, um, a direct association with the progression of myopathy, breathing issues, and swallowing issues. And here's just a breakdown of the signs of weakness that were observed in manual muscle testing. So um, as I said before, all 17 patients with a degree of weakness had distal upper extremity weakness. This was most commonly in the intrinsic muscles of the hand, which are responsible for fine motor functions. Eight patients also had proximal upper extremity weakness, which was most commonly in neck flexion. Only two patients had distal lower extremity weakness, which was primarily in toe extension. And four patients had proximal lower extremity weakness, primarily in hip abduction. <laughs> so, um, to continue to elaborate on our initial results, um, there were significant changes in the time, timed up and go and the 25 foot walk between visit one and two. So, suggesting a progressive uh, progression of weakness over a one year time period. There were significant improvements in maximum expiratory pressures and peak cough flow after respiratory training, suggesting that muscles that are experiencing weakness may be responsive to targeted intensive exercise to improve function. And there were no associated differences in swallowing measures or patient reported outcomes, suggesting that perhaps our um, assessment techniques were not sensitive or specific enough to capture change um, 
over time, or these changes are happening more slowly, of course. So given what we had learned in phase one and two of the study, we wanted to kind of learn more about what specific muscles are affected in these patients and um, we wanted to use outcome measures that were more sensitive to detect these oh sorry um, that were sensitive enough to detect these changes over time sorry um, so we have three different aims of this new study so the first aim is to further characterize myopathy using electrodiagnostic techniques so we'll be using EMG or electromyography which is a way Way of um, testing the muscle activity, and we're doing that in two different muscles, in the um, first dorsal interosseous muscle of the hand, which is one that is very affected in patients with cystinosis, and then we're also um, testing the vastus lateralis muscle of the quadricep, which is one that is not affected in these patients. So the reason why we're doing um, both an affected and non-affected muscle is that previous studies have actually found that you can detect myopathy in patients with cystinosis using EM even in the absence of apparent muscle weakness, so meaning in patients with no um, symptoms of muscle weakness and with no signs on manual muscle testing, that the myopathy can still be detected. Um, we are also using the, a new um, swallowing outcome that Stacey will talk about in a minute, and then we are supplying muscle biopsy tissue to some collaborators at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, and they're studying satellite cells, which are precursors to skeletal muscle cells, and, and they are responsible for the ability for skeletal muscle to regenerate. Um, and so we are supplying the tissue to them and then they're doing an analysis to see if they can isolate these stem cells. And in some of their preclinical studies, they've found that they can isolate these cells and then actually introduce them into muscle tissue and that the muscle tissue can regenerate. So um, one thing that this can show um, if they are able to isolate the satellite cells, it might be able to show that um, the muscle might not be inherently damaged in patients with cystinosis, but that is actually um, to cystine accumulation. And I also just want to announce that we are actively recruiting for this study, and participation involves a one-time visit to uh, Mass General in Boston. And um, we're looking for males and non-pregnant females ages 18 to 70 who experience some degree of distal muscle weakness. And Stacy and I will be sitting out there at a table after this. So if anyone has any questions or is interested in learning more, please come and say hi to us. And there's a photo of Boston in the bottom right. Back to swallowing. Um, so we, um, it was obvious that we were not capturing swallowing in the way that we needed to. And um, just because you don't aspirate doesn't mean you don't have significantly difficult time swallowing from both a safety and an efficiency standpoint. And so we took a look at the MBS-IMP, which is a modified barium swallow study impairment profile. It's an evidence-based validated tool, um, which assesses physiological impairments of swallowing and breaks it down into 17 distinct components um, and six in the oral phase. Um, 10 in the pharyngeal phase and one in the esophageal phase. And we looked at the utility of this um, tool to be able to analyze swallowing in a more sophisticated way, especially when we're looking at, okay, so you're having problems swallowing, what, what can we do about it? We just saw that people benefited from exercise a little bit. Um, how do we apply that to something even more um, you know, relevant to a lot of people? So. Um, we wanted to break down exactly what muscles are being affected and, and, and understand that better. So th to administer this, you, you, um, you give the patient a certain protocol of swallowing um, bolus trials during the fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy excuse me, and, um, and then after the study's completed, you evaluate each component across each swallow. So you look at lip closure, for example, if you've given 12 swallows of different consistencies um, and volumes during the swallow study, you then analyze lip closure in each one of those swallows, and then you create a severity rating based on um, the accumulation of those scores. So the, each component um, can be rated in terms of severity and impairment individually, and then you can clump them together and get an oral total impairment score with those first six components, and then pharyngeal, 
total um, impairment score with total impairment score with the rest of those domains and then um, the esophageal piece. So we were um, getting excited about swallowing and evaluating these patients um, in a different way and the world um, shut down. So we um, were not having as many people come to Boston and to participate in these continued swallowing studies that we were going to apply this new analysis to and better understand swallowing. But we were um, sitting on almost 60 swallowing studies that we had already completed um, from our previous phases of the swell of the um, the research and so with the support of the cystinosis research foundation we launched a retrospective analysis and we had 59 studies when patient wasn't able to come back for the third visit um, with our first phases of our study and um, we applied the, the MBS IMP to all 59 of those studies and um, it was um, really involved can you go back one slide Thanks. So, the, so this is really interesting. So we saw trends. So we had 15 patients that um, had normal swallowing across all three visits in the first phases of our swallowing study. But then when we look at this, we see actually um, almost all of the patients experience um, abnormal bolus transport and lingual motion, so changes in tongue function that and with gross analysis are not subtly captured. Um, we see that you know, um, sorry, I can't see the slide very well, but 80% um, of patients had um, difficulty, again, with oral phase. There's laryngeal closure issues. There's pharyngeal stripping issues that are resulting in residue. And these findings really correlated with the symptoms that people were talking about, their experience with swallowing. So we got really excited about this. Um, there, there's, to further just um, define these changes, there's no significant difference between oral total and pharyngeal total impairment scores um, from visit one to visit two. And so um, we don't see significant changes captured in that short time frame um, in swallowing as we had seen with some of the other um, myopathic assessments. Oral total scores significantly increased following EMST intervention. So. Um, I don't really like to talk about this finding because I don't understand it very well. It's not something that we would expect. So the EMST does not target muscles of the oral cavity specifically. However, there was structured exercise. People were putting a device in their mouth. And so this is something that was interesting and absolutely should be and can be explored further. And then the most important thing is that we had significant correlations between the pharyngeal total scores and the E10 and then between the oral total scores and the E10 and the MDADI. And so this is what we really were looking for. How do we evaluate swallowing and understand swallowing changes in patients with cystinosis in a way that correlates with their patient lived experience? So. Um, so it's really exciting change to the way we're thinking about about swallowing, um, but the takeaways in closing are that distal myopathy and dysphagia are common in patients with nephropathic cystinosis have a significant impact on patient function and quality of life. The MBS IMP um, is a really nice way to better understand these changes, um, and they correlate again with um, patient lived experience. So as we look for um, the, towards the future, um, we want to think about additional assessments um, in swallowing to administered to a larger, this was 10 patients, um, and we got some great information, noticing trends, changes over time, things that we can really think about to guide future directions, but, um, you know, looking at a larger population of patients is always great. Um, and then exploration of more sensitive and specific outcome measures that correlate with instrumental exams. So the instrumental exam is fancy, it's wonderful, it's not available to everyone. We need to look at tools that can be used in the clinical setting and correlate findings, for example, on the TOMAS, which were sensitive to changes in swallowing solids and, um, and, and these patients with um, the findings on instrumental exams and how can we make these tools more specific to our patients. Um, and then looking at utility of preventative measures, we know that um, people are at risk for developing changes to swallowing over time, um, in addition to these adult onset my myopathy and weakness development, and then is there something we can do to prevent this? Is there something that we can do to improve or maintain function? So, thank you. We are, um, we could never do this without the patients or um, the supporters, the collaborators, the funding, so the foundation. Um, and we're really um, so happy to be included in this day, in this weekend.